All right, why don't you uh, grab a Bible uh, and open it up to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, if you haven't been uh, around much, we are, uh, if you're visiting, we're doing a series on, on the Holy Spirit. I'm not sure what week we're in, but we're getting near the end. So we've got, we've got three more weeks, and these three weeks are... Um, are a series within a series, if you want. Uh, they're all about the Holy Spirit and, its, and, and His gifts. And so what I'm going to be doing over the next three weeks is looking at the, at the topic of spiritual gifts. So we're going to be doing 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, one chapter a week over the next three weeks. Well, it'll be interrupted because I'm off to our global gathering in Houston, so there'll be a gap in between. But those are the next three Sundays that I'm going to be doing will be 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. Um, let me say this just by way of additional introduction. Um, if, you're, if you're a Christian uh, here this morning, okay, if you're a Christian, whether or not you're new to Parkhurst, especially though if you are part of Parkhurst and you consider this your home, these next three weeks are incredibly, incredibly important uh, for you uh, because our deep desire is that everyone who um, says and claims to follow Jesus, and has made this their spiritual home, needs, I believe, biblically, to understand how God has gifted you, and made you, and wired you to serve amongst God's people. That this is actually one of the most important things that you can discover before, I mean, outside of coming to faith in Jesus Christ, understanding what role you play in the body that God has joined you to called the church. Is, is maybe the second most important question you can answer because it, it, it shapes your life and your priorities, um, yeah, what you give your energy to, uh, what brings you joy, how you fulfill the mission of God. There's a million things you look, we'll see, not a million, but a few things we'll see over the next few weeks of just how radically important this is. That's if you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian here and you're here this morning, I'm thrilled you're here. Uh, you're very, very welcome. But some of what I'm going to say over the next couple of weeks, you might think, like, this doesn't really mean much to me. You know, I still got tons of questions about Christianity. Uh, my life is a mess. That's why I'm here. And, and, I, and I'm glad you're here. And what you're going to get is, in, over the next couple of weeks, is a window into, I think, what God is calling you to. You just, you're not there yet. You have to answer some other questions around who Jesus is and what, you know, coming into a relationship with Him. But as you're going to hear... Um, this is where the, I believe the trajectory of your life is going to go. As you meet Jesus, He fills you with His Spirit, and everything in your life will change. Because this is what God has made you for. And there's no accident that you're here this morning, whether or not you have faith yet in Him. This is where you are going. And you're going to hear more about how, how God has called you to something far more important than just living for yourself and living day to day and selling your soul to your company and a million other things. You're going to hear about the glory of what God has actually made you for. Are you with me? Good. Let's, uh, let's read. Well, no, let's not read. Let's do more introductions. This could turn into a five-week series if I don't... Well, this, is the, uh, this is the last thing I'll say about introduction. Some context quickly. I'll do this one quickly. We're dealing with the Holy Spirit. So if we do a timeline all the way back here, uh, it, it's tempting in some areas of Christianity to believe that the Holy Spirit sort of arrives on the scene in the New Testament. Like there's nothing in the Old Testament... Holy Spirit in the New Testament, woo, off we go. But if you read the Bible carefully, you'll see that there is activity and presence of the, of the Spirit through the Old Testament. I think I would acknowledge, I think the Bible makes it clear that the, the activity and the, the presence of the Spirit of God in the Old Testament is less intense than you see in the New Testament under the New Covenant kind of thing. It's more sporadic. The Spirit seems to come upon people for a season or for a task or for an event or something and then kind of depart and then come and go. The, the, the people in the Old Testament are not indwelt with the Holy Spirit in the same way that New Testament, New Covenant believers are. And so you see the promise of, of, a, of a time coming in the Old Testament when believers would be filled uh, with the Spirit. That, that's kind of when John the Baptist arrives on the scene preparing the way for Jesus. What does he say? He says, the, I'm coming to prepare the way for the Messiah, and when he comes, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Isn't that cool? Some of you are like, I didn't sign up for that. Well, toughies, I mean, 
he says, I'm gonna, he, when he comes, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And that's exactly what you see happen. And so John the Baptist is the, is the preparer of the way. You see Jesus arrive, and exactly what happens. The Messiah comes, and he, he says, if I do all of these things, if I uh, raise the dead, the blind see, the lame walk, whatever, then you know that the kingdom of God has come amongst you, and I do all of these things through the Holy Spirit. It always says Jesus was filled with the Spirit, and then he went and did this, he did this, he did this. So Jesus does all of his ministry in the power of the Spirit, but it's not just Jesus. If you pay attention, you read the Gospels, he sends out the 72. He sends out his disciples, he sends out the 72, he says, go, kind of in the authority I'm giving you, and go and do the things that I've been doing. So you rock up there, pray for the sick, do this, drive out demons, do all this stuff, and they go, and what happens? The action, action, the stuff actually happens. They do those things. They come back celebrating. They're like, Jesus, you won't believe what happened. What you told us to go and do, we actually did it. And he just tells them to calm down. He says, don't rejoice that the demons are subject um, to you, but rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Don't get the order wrong here. Celebrate first that you belong to him and then that he uses you. So you see activity amongst the 12 and the 72, and then you see Pentecost arrives. And the Spirit is poured out, the prophecy of Joel on every believer. Everyone gets filled with the Spirit. And we now live 2,000 years later where every believer is indwelt and filled with the Holy Spirit in an ongoing way and gets given gifts to participate in the mission of God. Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to read the whole thing. It's long-ish. I'll read it as fast as it makes sense. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you used to be enticed and led astray by mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. There are different activities, but the same God works all of them in each person. A manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person for the common good. To one is given a message of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, a message of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the performing of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, dis distinguishing between Spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. One and the same Spirit is active in all these, distributing to each person as He wills. For just as the body is one, that has many parts, and all the parts of that body, though many are one body, so also is Christ. For we are all baptized by one Spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we are all given one Spirit to drink. Indeed, the body is not one part, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it's not for that reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it's not for that reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where, where would hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God has arranged each one of the parts in the body just as he wanted. And if they were all the same part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Or again, the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that are weaker are indispensable. And those parts of the body that we consider less honorable, we clothe these with greater honor, and our unrespectable parts are treated with greater respect, and our respectable parts, that, which our respectable parts do not need. Instead, God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the less honorable, so that there would be no division in the body, but that the members would have the same concern for each other. So if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. But if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, Next, miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, leading, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all do miracles, do all have the gifts of healing? 
Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But desire the greater gifts, and I will show you an even better way. Let's pray as we come to dig into God's Word together. Father, we, we thank you for your Word. We thank you that week by week as we gather um, to look and to listen, you are faithful to teach us um, and to speak to us through um, <clears throat> the person and the ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit. And so it's, um, it's, it's to you again that we look this morning and say, Father, would you please come and would you speak, would you teach us? You know what we need to hear. You know the ways in which we need to be taught, the provocations and encouragements that we need. We pray that you would fix our eyes and our attention and our minds now on what you, the living God, are saying to us individually and together as a church that we would leave this place this morning rejoicing that you, our our living God, our our Father, have spoken to us and shaped us now uh, through your word. And We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Corinthian church, um, is, it, it, you can make a case that the Corinthian church is Paul's favorite church. Uh, I mean, it's not the strongest case in the world, but I think you can make it. You, we have more documentation and correspondence with the Corinthian church than almost any other church that Paul um, has. We have first and second Corinthians, longish letters. Uh, other letters are way shorter. Um, and he seems to have an affection for the Corinthian church um, that's kind of different to some of the other churches and a concern. So this, the Corinthian church, uh, is a mixed bag. It's a mixed bag. Whenever anyone asks me, how's the church going? You know, um, this is kind of like what pastors do. This is an insight into pastors' world. When you bump into other pastors or people say, hey, how's your church going? I'm, you know, I always say it's a mixed bag. Not that you are a mixed bag. I mean, you are a mixed bag. Uh, we are a mixed bag. I'm going to put myself somewhere else. Like, there are always wonderful things happening in a church, and there are always challenging things happening in a church. There are always people who are sick or struggling or battling, and there are people who God is drawing to Himself, who are becoming Christians, who are discovering the life of the Spirit in new ways and being shaped and changed and breaking through things, and it's, it's always a mixture in a, in a church. Looking across this room, there's so many people in different places this morning with different things going on. Some of you are like, it's been the best week ever. And some of you are like, I'm just, you're just lucky I'm here. I'm here. Like, don't make this long. Um, you know? And, and, and everyone in between that. And the Corinthian church is kind of like that because they are the most gifted church that Paul uh, relates to. And yet they are the most sinful church that Paul relates to. It's in the Corinthian church that you find grievous sin, like dudes sleeping with their stepmoms, oaks getting plastered at communion. You know, I think our church has problems. These oaks are like, uh, I hope, a few steps ahead of us. Um, that's why we use grape juice, by the way. I'm just, just joking. That's a whole separate series for another time. We're going to move towards strong stuff in time, but anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, This is a church where they're experiencing so much of the Spirit of God at work in them and gifting and progress, and yet there's so much chaos also in the church. There's groupings, they're like, there's these guys who I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, others I follow Jesus, you know, that kind of crowd. There's like disunity and chaos in the church, and yet there is amazing things happening by the Spirit of God in the church. I say that because when we deal with things around the Spirit and gifts, they are a bundle package, and that's why we're doing three weeks. Today we're doing 12. Next week we're going to do 13. 13, if you know the Bible well, is the chapter on love. It's the one that you hear at weddings, or don't hear at weddings anymore because it's been overused kind of thing. Uh, at weddings. I preached on 1 Corinthians 13 at a wedding two weeks ago for the first time in my life. Yeah, because everyone always says, don't ever mention the love thing. It's too tired, you know, and I've never done it. So I did it finally at a wedding, and I loved it. Um, but it's got nothing to do with marriage. It's got everything to do with how the church used the gifts amongst them. And it's sandwiched in between 
Paul talking about the gifts and the imagery of the body, and what we'll get to in chapter 14, prophecy, tongues, miracles, healing, all the wild stuff, what some people would consider the wild stuff, um, sandwiched in between there is the character of people in the church and how you use the gifts God has given you. And he, he would argue, and I'll argue this next week, that's, that, is, that is more important than the fact that you may have any one of the number of gifts God has given the church. How you fulfill that within the body takes precedence over the fact that you actually are gifted. So this Corinthian church is a complete mixed bag. As we dive into these three chapters, you'll see. But here are a few things for us to note out of this passage. First thing is that spiritual gifts are given for what Paul calls the common good. The common good. In verse 7, it says a manifestation of the Spirit. That's a word to use around the bra. Manifestation. Um, that'll scare people. Uh, a manifestation, evidence is the, is the translation of that. And the evidence of the Spirit is given to each person for the common good. Why has, if you're a Christian, why has God gifted you with spiritual gifts? Um, it's for the common good. It's not for you. It's not so that you would feel powerful, useful, any, any number of a million things. It's so that the rest of the body would be blessed and benefit from what God has given to you. Um, I can't stress this enough, that when we focus on ourselves when it comes to spiritual gifting, our eyes are pointing in the wrong direction. The whole point of this is that you, you're given a manifestation of the Spirit so that the others, just have a quick look around you, like genuinely, this is not like, oh yeah, like look around you in the room. This is the church that you're a part of. The gifts that God has given you are meant to serve these people sitting on your left and right, the others who aren't with us this week, the others who will still join us. This is the playground for the, for the, for the gifts that God has, has given you for the most part. It's not about you. It's about us. It's not about you. It's about us. It's given for the common good. Second thing is that the gifts of the Spirit are meant to unite the body. Spiritual gifts are meant to pull a church together around the mission of Jesus and, and, and towards greater love um, for Him. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit's um, nature and role is to bring about greater unity in the body. It says that that's how Paul uses the, the, the metaphor of a body, and we'll dig into that a little bit, but he says that we're all given the same, we're baptized into the same um, spirit, this, baptized into relationship with Jesus. We're all given the same spirit to drink. There's not like preferences. You know, it's not like you got this and you got that and you got that. Everyone gets the same spirit because the Holy Spirit is the one who unites us to Jesus. It's the most common thing. That's why we say this fairly often. You have more in common with the believer in Jesus in rural Indonesia than you have with your own blood family who do not know Jesus. I know some of you are like pushing back saying, no, nah, whatever, nah, you're trying to break up my family. No, I'm not, man. Hang on with your family, bra, whatever. All I'm saying is the spiritual reality is that God has brought you into a family and baptized you and given you the same spirit that connects you eternally to his body and his family that is spread throughout the millennia and around the world. And you have more in common. That's why you can go all over the place and you can worship Jesus, pray, fellowship with other believers. You don't even have to understand the language that you're with because there's something about the spirit of God uh, between people. Claire and I were at a, um, at a rugby match uh, I won't give you extra information, but our one kids just moved schools, and so we're the newbies and stuff, so we're on the side of the field, and we're trying to make friends, because, you know, that's what we're like. Well, Claire's trying to make friends. I'm trying to watch the rugby. Uh, that's actually the true story. And uh, these people wander over to us, and they, they're very friendly, but I, you know, I was more focused on the rugby than on the people, but on reflection, we were talking about them, and I realized, I think these people are believers. They didn't say anything. We didn't talk about church. I normally keep the fact that I'm a pastor. 
under wraps for as long as possible because normally torpedoes relationships um, and everyone gets weird around pastors. But I, th- those people are Christians. They didn't say anything about their faith. They didn't mention their church, nothing. But there's something, if you've experienced this, where you bump into another person, you realize, I think this, there's a spiritual witness between the two of us. I think this person, we're part of the same family. We're, we're, we're Christians together. And that can happen in Joburg. It can happen, like I said, in Indonesia. There's something that's stronger, a bond between us through the Spirit. And it's meant to unite us because we are a body. Have a look in verse 24. It says, Instead, God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the less honorable, so that there would be no division in the body, but the members would have the same concern for each other. There would be no division in the body. One of the reasons why God has given a variety of gifts is that it would pull us together, not divide the body. And sadly and strangely, some of the history of the church is that we have let our flesh and carnal things get in the way that believers have divided over the gifts instead of allowing the Spirit to pull the body closer together. It's, it, it's the wrong way around. The gifts are supposed to build and pull a body together rather than divide. And so there's, there's nothing wrong with the Spirit. There's nothing wrong with the gifts. There's something wrong with us and how we have elevated these things or misinterpreted them. But that's the point that gifts are meant to unite. Third thing is that gifts are given through the Holy Spirit as He wills. In verse 11, you see it. One and the same Spirit is active in all these, distributing to each person as He wills. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions throughout the morning to keep you awake and make you think. How has God gifted you? Do you know? Do you know? Second question, how do you want God to gift you? I've been a pastor for long enough that I've prayed with a lot of people who want particular gifts. One of my next points is about desiring the gifts. They want to be gifted in this way or that way, have these different things. And I think this point is very important for us. This is the Holy Spirit is the one who does the distributing as He wills. God is less interested in what you want and more interested in what He wants for you and what He realizes that you need. I think if God answered all of our requests with a yes, we would be in a world of trouble. I, and, and it's interesting when you pray, pray with people, um, I've prayed with lots of people who want the gift of healing, the gift of prophecy, the gift of tongues, the gift of evangelism. I have never, ever had anyone come to ask me to pray for them for the gift of celibacy. Never. Not one person. I said, Lord, would you, Doug, would you just pray for me? Pray the Lord to give me just the joy of the gift of never being married, never having sex kind of thing. Please pray that over my life. Never, ever had that. But they, everyone wants the whiz-bang, woohoo when the spirit around the room kind of vibes, uh, the gifts, the spectacular thing. And <clears throat> I think we need to settle in our hearts that God knows best how to gift you. You need, you need to bank this, that God knows you better than you know yourself. And God knows your church better than you know it. And so if God gives you a gift, it's for a specific reason. And if He doesn't give you a gift... It's also for a specific reason. And so our, our hankering to be something that we're not, we'll get into this, basically to use the body imagery, the hand that longs to be a foot is a really bad hand. Some of you are hands, you don't know it yet, and all you do is ache to be a foot. And I love what Paul says, that the, the body is interdependent. interdependent. Every part of the body is valuable and necessary, and you need to figure out which part you are and which part you play. But settle in our hearts that God has gifted you as the Spirit wills. And because God has made us and knows us and loves us, we need to make peace with it. Say, thank you, God, for gifting me or not gifting me the way that you have. Next thing, that every gift is important and necessary. I hope that if you're a Christian here this morning, you have banked this truth that every single believer in Jesus is gifted by the Spirit of God. Every single believer. It's not like 
these guys are gifted or I'm gifted or we, we only give a microphone to those who are gifted. Um, the biblical reality is that every single believer in Jesus has been given a or several spiritual gifts. And we'll talk about how you discover those things and how they're distinct from talents in a, in a minute. But you need, you need to bank that because some this is important because the gift that you're given is meant to be used for the common good, for the strengthening of the church. So if you, if you think, I'm not gifted, or I don't, God overlooked me, you know, I was late to the party, I was at the back of the queue, whatever, you ran out of gifts, you know, or whatever you think, uh, what, what actually happens is that you rob, you rob the body of greater health and effectiveness. You rob yourself of the joy of being used by God in that. But essentially, you, you rob the body of, of, a, of a well-functioning hand. For and you could keep going with the hand thing. Of a well-functioning hand because you think, you know, I just make up the numbers. I come. This is interesting, whatever else. But I don't feel like God has gifted me. That scares me. What if he gives me a gift? What if he gives me tongues? I don't want tongues. I don't want tongues. And then give that to somebody else. And what a prophecy or miracles or martyrdom or whatever else, like, no, nah, you know, like, that you need to answer the previous question, God knows best what you need. So if God gives you a gift, that, that's, the, that's the gift that you need, and I think, you'll, I think you'll celebrate it, that's my view, that everyone is gifted. Have a look, oh, we won't reread it just for the sake of time, from verse 15 onwards. No one can say that they're not needed. No one can say that they're not uh, needed. The foot can't say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. Just because the way God has gifted you, uh, you can't say, well, yeah, I'm not that, so I'm not going to do anything. I'd rather be a foot than God's made me a hand. I'm a bit frustrated by this. The body needs you as you are for its health and its strength. That's why it's so important to figure out um, how God has gifted you and how He's why you and made you, and how he wants to use you as a blessing in the church. You can't say you're not needed. You can't say you'd rather be something else. The ear can't say I'd rather be an eye, because then it's, it becomes less of an ear. I, I don't think it becomes less of an ear. It's just it's like a resentful ear. This imagery is going to break down at some point. But uh, you know what I'm saying? If you're an ear, you just be the best ear you can be. You don't hanker to be an eye. You're not going to be an eye. You're going to be an ear. So figure out how to be the best ear you can be. I should have used another body part, but I mean, the ears just hang out there, kind of thing, don't do much. Um, don't long to be something else. And, and, and verse 21 onwards makes it clear that you can't say that we don't need other gifts. We can't say, well, these gifts are really important. Those gifts, less so. Uh, you, I, I'm going to talk near the end around a, a, a spiritual gifts questionnaire that we're going to encourage you all to take. And it gives a list of gifts, and one of them is administration as a gift. And probably comes as no surprise to many of you that I didn't score very highly. Um, on, why are you laughing, John? Uh, I didn't score very highly on administration. And, and I wasn't crestfallen about it. It was not a surprise um, to me. But I know others score highly on administration, but because it's not a thing for me, you know, it's possible for me to think it's not a thing in the kingdom. Like, we don't need the gifts of administration. We need all these other things. And yet God has given people with the gifts of administration, craftsmanship, hospitality. We can keep the list going, mercy, all of that. Every gift plays its part. And no one can say, this gift is better or more important than that part. That's part of Paul's uh, argument in the body. He says, the bits that you think are unimportant are actually the most important. Did you catch that? The bits that you think are unimportant are the most important. Many of us are going to get an absolute shock when you arrive in the new heavens and the new earth and realize what heaven celebrated while we were here and who was effective in the ongoing mission of the kingdom of God. We think it's people with microphones and instruments and upfront gifts. The longer you spend in the kingdom of God, you realize that most of the activity is the behind-the-scenes stuff. The old grannies who are locked in at retirement homes who pray faithfully, no one knows about it, 
and they move the hand of God to cause revivals to break out all over the place. No one knows their name. No one will ever know their name here. But heaven celebrates that they move the kingdom of God forward more than a million me's who yapper on every Sunday trying to preach the Bible. We have it all the way, wrong way around. The kindness of hospitality, opening up your home, what that can do for people, how that can put their life together again. Do you know the power of hospitality? Having someone who feels rejected, welcome to sit around your table and feel loved when nobody else loves them. The trajectory that they can put their life on, it's not celebrated. No one here is going to give you a naughty badge or make a video of you or find you on the internet. Heaven is watching. Heaven is watching. And we're going to get a surprise when we see the effect of how God has wired his body. You can't say that no other gift is needed. <clears throat> Second, third, last thing. The strength of gifting varies. The strength of gifting varies. This is something that I think you again need to settle in your heart. That God, through the Holy Spirit, gives different gifts to different people, but he also gives the gifts in different measure to different people. Not everyone is equally gifted in every area. Um, and, and this rubs some people the wrong way. And you can think like, well, Lord, I want to be more gifted in this. Like, I don't want to just be like down there. I want to be up there. I want to like, oh, you know, and it's like, well, God hasn't given you that gift. To put it very bluntly, some of us believers are one talent believers and others are 10 talent believers. Are you with me? Some of us are one talenters, others are 10 talenters because the talents are given by who? By the master. Amen. The master gives the talent. And he says, I'm entrusting this to you. To those whom much is given, much will be demanded. But you don't get to choose how much you're given. You don't get to apply and see how much. He gives as he sees fit and for a purpose and for a season and for a time and for whatever. But you don't get to sit there and think, well, just because I've got one talent. The oak who got one talent, what did he do? He went and buried it in the ground and he got into trouble. So just because you get given one talent, don't go and bury it in the ground. Say, I've got one talent. Because the master is saying, well, I gave you one. You could have invested it. At least I'd have two. So just because you're a one-talent person, we live in a world that's obsessed with performance and stuff like that, uh, making peace with the fact that, God, you've gifted me like this. My gifts are not about me. They don't define who I am. They don't, it's not an, a definition of worth. They are functional for the ongoing mission of the kingdom of God. And if you obsess about gifts, your eyes are set on the wrong thing. Obsess about Jesus. Obsess about Him. Don't worry. Don't keep your eyes fixed on the gifts. Fix your eyes on Him. Because there's your joy. There is all of our joy is in Him. The gifts are just a, a thing that God uses in us and amongst us for the health of the body, the common good. But the strength of gifting varies. It says there in verse um, 6 of Romans chapter 12, I don't think this is on the screen. It says that according to the grace given to us, we've got different gifts. There's grace given to people to teach the Bible to thousands of people. And there's grace given to people to teach the Bible to 50 people. There's grace given to people for big healing kind of ministries. And there's grace given to people to pray for healing in their local church kind of thing. And, you know, we could keep going on with this. Um, making peace with the fact that God knows the level of gifting that he's given you, and he's responsible for it. And your peace with that is a, is a big part of this. Next thing is that I think we're, we're instructed to desire and pursue the gifts. I mention this because some people, some of you are sitting here thinking, this is not important for me. I just like coming here. I like being encouraged. I like being part of the vibe and whatever else. Biblically, Paul says, desire. I don't think it's an encouragement. I think it's an instruction. Verse 1 of chapter 12, he says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be unaware. I don't want you to live unaware. I don't want you to just not know anything about this. You need to figure this stuff out. Even though there's all this spiritual chaos going on in the Corinthian church, 
He doesn't want them to be unaware. Have a look down in verse 31 of chapter 12. It says, desire the greater gifts. There's no mistranslation of that. That's what it says, guys. Desire the greater gifts. So yes, the Holy Spirit does gift according to His wisdom and His plan. He gives a strength of gifting as He sees fit. But there is also this encouragement to desire the greater gifts. There is nothing wrong with you desiring a gift from God. But again, we're going to look at next week, why are you desiring that gift? It all revolves around why you want to be gifted in a particular way. But there's nothing wrong, I think, with desiring the greater gifts. We're, we're called to do that. Chapter 14, you jump ahead, it says, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, especially that you would prophesy. Now, I know you're all having heart palpitations, yeah. That's what it says here. I'm not making it up. I'm quoting. I'm just reading the Bible out loud to you. It says, desire spiritual gifts, especially that you would prophesy. When was the last time you pleaded with God and prayed, God, would you give me the gift of prophecy? If you haven't, you have not fulfilled that injunction, that encouragement, that, des uh, that desire of Paul. I would say it's almost an instruction and a command to pray the God. Because, and I'm ruining the movie for you when we get to prophecy, the effect that prophecy has on a local church is dynamite both for the believer and for the unbeliever. But we'll get there when we get to chapter 14. Don't worry about it. But it says, desire spiritual gifts. Verse, chapter 14 and verse 39, Paul says, So then, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy, and don't forbid speaking in tongues. Be eager to prophesy. Paul's whole attitude is desire gifts and be eager to exercise them. Don't be like hiding there. Look, I hope I don't get picked on. I hope. The Spirit doesn't fall on me and I get that gift or that gift. This is be eager, desire, long for these things because it's not about you. It's not about you. It's about the body. It's about the body benefiting from what God gives you. And if you love the head of the body, you will love His body, which is the church that you're part of, and you will long to be the most effective part of that body and make it as healthy as it possibly can be. Because not, not because your primary love is for the body, but your primary love is for the head of the body, Jesus. And his primary love is what? The body. So when you love him and you get what he loves the most, that's how Christians end up loving the church. is because you love Jesus and he gives you a love for what he loves and that's the church. Okay, as we close this out, how do you discover your gifts? Are spiritual gifts just supercharged natural abilities? It's a good question, isn't it? I mean, how do you know what a spiritual gift is? There are some. Um, there are some that are, I would, I would say, elevated natural abilities. Okay? Um, it's, it is usual. It is normal. It's okay. Maybe normative is the, maybe the word. For God to give uh, the gift of preaching or teaching to people who, who are naturally okay with Speaking and being upfront and being eloquent and being verbose. Is that what you <laughs> Using too many words, uh, taking longer than they need to. I think that's definitely a spiritual gift of continuation of sermons. Um, it's, it's not like that you would be absolutely terrified and a stutter and whatever else, and like that, that, that's the only way God works, that He gives the gift to, because then it's definitely God, you know, like you left on your own. Um, you'd be a right off, you need the Spirit of God. That does sometimes happen, but sometimes it's that God just uses a natural ability and endows it with a, spir a spiritual grace. I mention this because there is this kind of weird distinction that you get in, in, in this thinking that, and that your natural abilities are not a gift of God's grace. Your natural abilities came from somewhere else, not from God. That's nuts, isn't it? Your ability to do things naturally, even that is a gift of God's grace. You've been made in the image of God. The fact that you can, I don't know, do whatever is itself a gift of grace. Whether you're a Christian or not, those natural abilities are God's gift. Then he adds his spirit onto them. And I think 
the difference between a natural ability and a spiritual gift is that the spiritual gift benefits the church primarily. It's when you use it, the Spirit of God falls upon that and elevates it and emphasizes it, and it benefits the body of believers. But sometimes there is a natural ability component to it. Some of the gifts, though, fall outside of that zone. So nobody is born with a natural ability to prophesy, by the way, or, or perform miracles, or speak in tongues, or heal people, or interpret tongues, or have words of knowledge or words of wisdom. That's not a natural ability. Those all fall in, if you want, a supernatural kind of realm, and we're going to deal with those when we get to chapter 14. So those things are maybe more evident, and I'm going to talk when we get to 14 about that distinction. All of them come from God, though. They are all spiritual gifts. So how do you, how do you know? How do you discover what is a spiritual gift? Well, there's a few options. One of them is to take a test. It's not conclusive. It's not like this is an oracle that speaks to you, and, and there you go. You'll find on the chairs, I think, something, a fly called Find Your Fit. It's over there as well. It's called Find Your Fit. What we've done is that um, Dave has digitized a spiritual gifts questionnaire test. If you go to parkerscommunitychurch.ca.za forward slash spiritual gifts test, you will find the test there. It'll take you between 20 and 30 minutes, depending on how much attention you pay, to do that test. My encouragement and my hope is that every single person who calls Parkhurst their church will do this. Will do it. You will then, once you've finished it, you'll get an email that will tell you um, your different gifts. It, it ranks them, gives you numbers there, and it gives you a link to download a guide that we've put together that explains a definition of all the gifts, how to develop in that gifting, how to use that gifting more in Parkhurst Community Church, what books to read, some resources to grow in that area of gifting. Okay, this has taken us months to put together. I'm skimming over it now, but it's been a big deal, and Dave has done an amazing job putting this stuff all together. Our hope is that every single person will do this. Every question you get asked has four answers. I can't remember them off the top of my head, but the an one answer is never, and the, the, like the proper, the, not the proper, the positive answer is mostly. So I think it goes never, sometimes, often, mostly. Okay? This is just, I mean, this is like a ra random detail, but very important. When you take the test, don't be scared to answer never or mostly. Okay? We're not going to distribute your test to the whole world and, th and then like laugh at you. Like, this person's so arrogant. When they say, like, I teach the Bible, people get it mostly. You know, like, that's arrogant. If that happens most of the time, please put mostly. If it never happens, don't put sometimes or often. Put never. It'll ask you, have you ever prayed for somebody to receive their sight? If that's never happened, answer never. Don't often, oh, maybe, some, I don't know. Like I, did, I, I prayed for somebody at the optometrist, and they phoned me later, and I, everything was better. Like That didn't happen. It wasn't you. Never. I, I, because if you don't answer strongly, it, what it does is it flatlines your gifts, and you end up being averagely gifted across the whole board, and it's not helpful for you to see and to discern how God has wired you. So be as honest as you can. Don't overthink the test. It's one of these, like, it's, it's almost like a personality test. Don't, don't, don't answer who you hope you are. Oh, yes, that, that, uh, yes, I hope to be often. Or, um, th th just say no. And, and if some of the things don't make sense to you, do your best. It's, this is not the oracle, okay? It's a helpful guide. It's not without error at all, but it'll help you with some of the stuff. And later on today, we will WhatsApp you the link to find this thing. And I encourage you to find 20 or 30 minutes. If you're part of a community group on Wednesday and Thursday, whenever you meet, you're going to be talking about this in your community groups for a couple of weeks. Uh, not just because we want to have an interesting, oh, what did you get? What did you get? What did you get? You know, what Pokemon card have you got kind of uh, conversation? We want everyone exploring and using the gifts that God has given them for your joy and for the church's benefit. We get better and stronger all together when we are using the gifts God has given us. You discover your gifts by trial and error. 
by trial and error. Just try something. If you're not in a serving team anywhere in the church, I would encourage you to find a place to serve. The best way to discover whether you're gifted in something is to give it a bash. And you let everybody else decide. That would be my, my second last pointer. Let the community decide the strength and the validity of your gifting. Don't think you've heard from the Lord, yes, I'm gifted in this area. No one can touch me. No one can question me. Let the community discern and say, as a body, yeah, we feel like you're a hand. The rest of the body gets to call you a hand. You don't get to be a self-proclaimed hand. Everyone's looking at you and thinking, you're more an ear. You're like, nope, no, I'm a hand. You're like, no, 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 you're definitely an ear. We don't feel much hand uh, from you. Uh, when we're around you, there's no hand vibes. There's a lot more ear vibes coming from you, you know. To put that in concrete things, if you feel like you have the gift of teaching, and when you teach, things are as clear as mud, you may not have the gift of teaching because the body don't feel like, oh, yeah, this is a gift we receive from you. If you feel like you have the gift of hospitality and no one ever wants to come to your house, I hang out with you. You're like Norman, no friends. Every weekend, blue ticked, ghosted, you may not have the gift of hospitality. I submit that to you. Um, so just you know, let the community decide. Let others affirm and clarify for us. This is not a competition. This is not a competition. No gifts are better than others, but we want to get clear. And then pray. Pray. Pray, God, would you give me wisdom? Would you help me to discern? Would you help me to see? Would you lead? Would you confirm for me? Sometimes, sometimes you need a lot of God's grace to receive um, somebody else's encouragement that you have a gift. And somebody calls it out in you and saying, I believe you're gifted in this. And I think you need to grow in it. And sometimes it may be a bolt out of the blue for us. Some I said are elevated natural abilities, but sometimes it's, 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 it's out of nowhere, and you're like, wow, that's, that's news to me. And uh, so we need to be praying. That's enough for session one, I think. Let's, we want to come to communion together. Let me ask you one closing question. How, how are you gifted? How are you gifted, and how are you using that gift amongst this body of believers? It's really, really important that you discover and you implement. You serve. Not just because we want a database of all these people doing these things, because, as I said, and I'll repeat again and again, your joy and your purpose is deeply connected to this. It's deeply, deeply connected to this. This is more important than the other stuff that you do. Because this endures. This endures. What you do for the kingdom of God endures. And it's for your joy. So it's not just massively important. It's not just for the health of the body. But I believe fully that God adds joy and purpose and meaning and satisfaction to be using your gifts uh, for the kingdom of God. Your joy is deeply connected to these things. We wouldn't have any gifts. We wouldn't have a church wouldn't have a mission if it wasn't for Jesus. I want to remind you again, we, we're doing a series on gifts so we can explore and get plugged in and, be bene and benefit one another and be more effective. But we would have none of it if it wasn't for Jesus. And so as we come to communion this morning, let's park the gifts thing a little bit and let's just ask God, would you fix our, our eyes and our hearts again on you? We need grace again from you, Jesus, as we come to remember you again. We remember your body given for us. We remember your blood shed for us. It's all about you. It's not, it's not really about the gifts. It's all about you. We, we, we want to love you. We want to receive your grace this morning. For some of you this morning, all of this has just gone sailing straight past you because your heart isn't in the condition for this. You have got greater needs, and you need more of God's grace this morning for whatever difficulties and struggles and the conversations going on in your own head. This is the time. This is the means communion, one of God's grace is given to us where you receive in fresh ways the grace of God for the particular struggles that you're going through. And so I want to encourage you as we come now, let's quieten our hearts, let's ask God for his help in our um, focus, in our attention. As we celebrate Jesus, we come to focus, we thank him, but we receive his gifts of grace again to us uh, this morning as we share together. If you're new, we don't know how it works, we eat and drink in our own time here. 
you come and grab the elements at the front or the back, return to your seat and um, share. You can, married couples, dating couples, whatever, you're happy to do that. You can pray with people next to you, whatever, float your boat and the team will lead us in worship as we continue. Let's pray as we come to the Lord's table now. Father, we, <clears throat> we thank you that um, your word speaks to us, and we pray that over the, over the coming weeks you would, be, you would be speaking, you would be revealing um, things to us as individuals, as a church, um, showing us the ways in which you have gifted us, uh, imparting new gifts to us that we would be fully alive and useful uh, and joyful believers, and it would be a healthier and stronger and more joyful body as your gifts find expression amongst us. But we thank you, um, Father, that your word reminds us that uh, we are part of a body because of what Jesus has done. Jesus, you are the head of the body. You are the life source that we receive and that we're connected to, we would have no life outside of you. We would have no meaning, we'd have no purpose, we'd have no joy outside of you. We wouldn't know the Father. We wouldn't have received the Spirit outside of you and what you have done for us. And so as we come to celebrate communion again this morning, we pray that in these moments, Father, you would impart uh, grace to us as we remember you, Jesus. We remember the, your great sacrifice for us on our behalf, being willing to go um, to the cross for us, give of your, your body uh, and your blood, that we may know the Father, that we may know life in your name, and that as we eat and drink, we pray that you would, um, you, that you would cleanse us again, that you would um, impart grace and strength and help to us, particularly those who are struggling this morning and, and battling and who need an impartation of your grace and your mercy and your help this morning. Give us great joy as we set our hearts and our eyes and our remembrance on you now as we eat and drink together. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.